Hola. Okay, nuggets. London. All right, so uh, just got back from London. We were there for five days. Um, so let's go in order. So first we flew business class, British Airways, which meant we got to go in the lounge. What's it called? The business lounge. Club, Club World. I think it's called Club World. Club Lounge, Club World. Which is really nice. They have free food there. It's not very good food, but who cares? Free food, free drinks, nice chairs, free Wi-Fi. It was just it's just this beautiful guilt laden experience that was wonderful um all f paid for by disney through jen the lovely jen who got us all sorted out so that was fantastic um so we flew to vietnam last year um and we splashed out it's for laura's 50th it's a belated birthday present for her um and we splashed out and flew business class and we flew something called asiana airlines business class and so we got to compare their business class versus British Airways. Now, I'd always heard the British Airways business class is the best in the world. It's not. It's really good. I, I, this is going to sound so ridiculous, but it's really good. It's wonderful. It's so much better than Coach. But it, it can't hold a candle to Asiana. And I mean, honestly, it really can't. And it's interesting reasons why. Firstly, the seats, though it's comfortable and you've got a lot of space, it's a little, I don't know, you're kind of right next to people. So it's not quite as separate you don't get quite your own little world and the second thing and this is really interesting maybe because this is personally to me it's worse the service is much worse the service is actually better <laughs> i would think to a lot of people but to me it's a lot worse because the 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 flight crew are very attentive but that means they're being very attentive all the time and it gets annoying right they're also very british which means that they're a bit jobs worth like they have a certain thing like so for example i'll give a perfect example on every flight you're going to at some point have the seatbelt sign go on and they need to come and check to have your seatbelts on right on asiana my wife was asleep for most of the flight they came up and they looked and they checked under her little blanket and they saw it was on and they walked away they didn't say anything and then they came and they looked at me and they couldn't see i had a blanket over and she just went like this and I, and I showed her, and she went, thank you, and she walked on. That was it, no sound. On British Airways, they walked up and down the carriage going, seatbelts, please, everyone put your seatbelts on. Ma'am, ma'am, do you have your seatbelts on? Thank you. Sir, do you have your seatbelt? My wife, who was full of sleep, just, they woke up because they leaned right in and went, ma'am, ma'am. They could have just lifted a blanket and looked. And yes, you're supposed to put it over the top of the blanket, and you can, you can, you can not be disturbed by doing that. But the truth is she didn't. And there was an easy way for them to get around it. But they're a bit jobs worth about it. They're very officious when they have something to do. It's the same as, you know, prepare for landing. They're walking up. They're going, prepare for landing. Nothing on the floor. So nothing on the floor. Could you just sit this? Could you? They're really in there and present. And it's a little tense. Actually, makes it a little bit more tense. Um, they also just talk to you a lot more. Maybe there was a language barrier with Asiana. But Asi Asiana. But um, they didn't really say much, but they were always there. If you wanted anything, you are just like, hey, excuse me, could I have a bowl of hot ramen? That actually happened on board. It was amazing. It was really good ramen as well. And she just went, yes. And then she went, she came back, she brought it back, she went, enjoy, and walked away. It was fantastic. Um, whereas on British Airways, everything is a long conversation. It's protracted. It's talking out, you know. Uh, we didn't fill in. Okay, another example on the way back. Neither my wife or I filled in the food order because we didn't want to eat, because we both wanted to sleep. We were both exhausted. I had back problems. I hadn't slept for two days. or I didn't sleep the night before, rather, because of my back problems. So we were just going to sleep. So we got on board. We waited for takeoff, reclined our seats, put the thing over and went to sleep. They then immediately started waking us up, just coming around saying, would you like any food, sir? Sir, would you like any food you haven't filled out? You met? Oh, Okay. And so now we're awake again. And that happened a few times in the flight. It was just frustrating. It's really kind of annoying. And, and the way the seats are laid out is not conducive for them to serving. If there are four seats across the middle and the two middle seats, in order to help them or serve them, you have to lean across the outside seat, which is where I was. So there's nothing the steward, the, the flight crew can't do anything about that. It's the layout of the plane. But just all of these little bits in general made it not quite at the level of Asiana Airlines. So there you go. Got it. I'm just as ridiculous that I'm complaining because I'm not complaining. It was still wonderful. But it's not the best in the world. 
There you go. Sorry. Might be in first class. There were a few people. Josh Gad was in first class on that flight. I'll have to ask him. I don't know. My wife does. Anyway. So there was that. We get to... They have a car to take us both ends. The airport. That was nice. It's really nice coming out of the airport and having someone with your name on a sign. It feels good. It feels really good. So they took us to... From Heathrow, we went to the hotel called the Corinthian. Okay. Holy shit. I thought I'd stayed in five class five star hotels. I had, right? I thought I knew what a five star was like. I thought it was just about, you know, have they got a pool? Have they got good facilities? Do they have like extensive room service? Do they have all of that kind of stuff? I thought I'd stayed in a five star hotel. Then I get to this hotel and I realize, oh, well, I've had no idea. <laughs> there's, there's a whole level of service. It's not one, two, three, four, five stars. It's one, two, three, four, five, five plus, five plus, plus, five plus, plus, plus. There's all of these extra layers of five star. I'd been staying in hotels that managed to reach five stars. And that's a great experience. They're awesome hotels. This was way above. It was insane. Our room was insane. The bathroom had a heated floor, heated marble floor. My wife took a video of both of us just standing there looking at our feet going, the floor's heated, the floor's heated. It was amazing. A full rain shower, like you turned it on and just the entire ceiling drenched rain on you. Um, beautiful, big, wide open bath, huge bed, great television with loads of entertainment, fully stocked bar. and uh, It was just amazing. You know, buttons, oh, they had control panels for the mood lighting. So you would just go and just press one button. They would auto on. Press the night button, it would go to night lighting. Press the mood button. All of this was, it was just buttons everywhere to do everything. It was absolutely fantastic. They had no USB outlets, which I thought was weird. Every good hotel I've stayed, every bad hotel I've stayed at, like there are USB outlets on like the, the, the lamp or on the plug. So you don't have to deal with um, currency differences, you know, uh, electric current differences. Um, sockets and stuff but this didn't whatever so we had to use our transformer everywhere but absolutely stunning hotel it's called the Corinthia or the Corinthian Corinthia I think it was on Whitehall so it's right near Downing Street and Trafalgar Square kind of in between embankment beautiful hotel stunning best hotel I've ever stayed at by far uh, I got a little bit self-conscious about the level of service because when you get to that level when you know when the doormen have top hats when you get to that level of hotel and there's red carpets everywhere. Um, it's a little weird because they want to do everything for you. And I'm still a working class boy at heart. I can't, I don't know how to handle that. You know, I get stressed out when someone wants to take my bag from me. I know like, I've got to do it. It's all right. But they were really nice. In the end, it was really nice because I have a story to tell about how we needed them. And they were just really helpful, but they were always there. What would you like for breakfast? Can we bring it to your room? We had breakfast in the room because Laura wanted to experience it. It was amazing. Massive table with a full English breakfast and coffee and tea and croissants and it was ridiculous. And we're in our robes, Corinthian robes and slippers. It was amazing. I really got to see how the other half lift, live and you know what? Money can definitely buy happiness in a hotel. Uh, it was amazing. So here's the story of it. The trip was great, but I want to get this story in so this video doesn't go too long. So I became a citizen six months ago. And I thought you automatically got a passport. I didn't realize until about eight weeks ago that you don't, because I'm an idiot. And I'm like, where's my passport, by the way? And then I realized, oh, I don't have one. Oh, I guess I have to apply. So then I applied for a passport. And when you apply for a passport, you give them your, oh, I don't have it handy. You give them your certificate of naturalization, and then they give you a photocopy. And then when you get your passport back from them, they send back the certificate and you get your passport. Um, so I sent off for one. Before I knew about the London trip, it was unrelated. But then the London trip came up, and I'm like, oh, I don't have my U.S. passport. What am I going to do? And I'm like, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I still have my British passport. I'm a dual citizen. I didn't ask for dual citizenship. I think you just get it. I don't know. People have asked me, like, did you? are you a dual citizen? I think everyone is. I don't know. I didn't get a choice. Anyway, I have my British passport. So I'm like, oh, I'll just fly for one last time. I was excited about using my U.S. passport. It's not here. I'll fly for one last time on my British passport. So we fly out there. We have a great trip. On the way back, I go to check in on the flight, and it says I'm not registered to travel. And I realized I can't get back into the country on my British passport without a U.S. visa or a green card or a permanent resident card. But they took my permanent resident card when you become a citizen because you're a citizen. You don't need one now. 
but I don't have a US passport. So I can't get back in, and no visa, I can't get back into the country. So I realized this on Sunday, we're due to fly on the Monday. So I call down to the concierge and I'm like, um, you must have heard of this before. This is the problem I'm having. And he was very nice and he said, no, this is the first time I've heard this, but we're gonna help you out. So he starts calling around everywhere. He starts phoning up British Airways. He phones, I think he phoned the embassy, trying to find out what to do. He said, and then he called me back a few hours later and said, from everything I can discover, I think you'll be fine. Just go to the airport and they'll see your documentation. Because I had a copy of my naturalization certificate and I am a citizen, so I'm, I know I'm in the system. And he said, you should be fine. The problem is, I think this guy was Polish or Romanian originally. I don't think he knows Britain <laughs> as well as I do and Jobsworth. And I knew if I went to the British Airways desk and said, look, I don't have my US passport, but I have all this. They would just say, sorry, I'm not letting you on. Because they get fined. British Airways get fined. If they let me on the plane and I get to customs and customs don't let me in, British Airways get fined thousands and thousands of dollars. So I think they would have just said no. End result is I had to go to the embassy on Monday morning. My flight's at 1, or at 12.45 in the afternoon. I go to the embassy, I make an appointment, I go to the embassy at 7.30 to try and get an emergency passport. So I'm stressed out. I, that's why I'm bad back, can't sleep anyway. Um, and I definitely couldn't sleep because I stressed out thinking I'm going to have to spend another day in London. I can't stay at this hotel. The hotel was like, the hotel was $1,000 a night. That's way out of my budget, right? Disney can pay that, I can't. So I'm stressed now, I'm, like, I'm gonna have to stay with my sister, and she's like, don't worry, you can come stay with me. So I go to the, go to the, the embassy first thing in the morning. Laura comes with me, because Laura's just, I'm, I'm shy and scared and a bit useless. Since, since I married her, I've become more useless in my life. I have, to, I have to have her there to help me out. So she's there to kind of, you know, be the charge for us. But we get there, the building's amazing. The building looks like um, the M headquarters in a James Bond movie. Everything is white panels and chrome, and it's all lit up, all the floors all light up. It's very minimal. The seats that are kind of built into these panels, and there's no, they're just floating in the air. It's the weirdest thing. It's, there's nothing there. There's no decoration whatsoever other than the architecture of the building. And it's all very quiet. You can hear people's footsteps from miles away. So we go in. The guy behind the desk, he's actually Scottish. He's, he was born near East Kilbride, which is where I was born. So that was fortunate. And I'm like, dude, I'm so stressed out. And he's like, don't worry, we'll get, we'll get you sorted out. Don't worry, mate. So eventually, so the first person we go to see, we get a ticket. And I'm going to explain. I have my story ready to explain it. I have documents. I have my certificate with me. I have everything I need with me, except my passport. I go to the first guy. I go, oh, dude, I've got to tell you. He said, have you applied for a passport before? I said, uh yes but but in england i do you have a passport no i the problem was that he went fill this out and i'm like can i explain your story can i explain my story i said i don't have a passport my flight's in two hours so i want to you're gonna miss your flight this will take about 20 minutes thank you he turned away so i think oh fuck, that's what this is going to be like this is going to be like a bureaucratic nightmare right this guy was just outright mean and aggressive to me it was first thing in the morning Laura's like, well, maybe he hasn't had his coffee, but he was just mean. I was like, fuck, this guy's like, he doesn't give a shit what's happening to you. American guy, didn't give a shit, right? So my wife goes to the first guy, the Scottish guy, and says, can you just make sure the next person we see is not him? And the guy says, it, it'll be fine, you won't see him. So they call my number up again. The next person, I could cry thinking about it, is completely different. She's smiling. She's like, hey, what's going on? She hears my story. I explain. She goes, oh, God, yeah, okay. Listen, we're going to get you on that flight. And suddenly the system kicks in. And basically I, I fill out the form. I have to buy a passport again because um, I've already paid for my passport that's in the mail somewhere. Um, I go up two or three times and they're talking me through it. They're hearing my story. They're like, yeah, don't worry, we're going to get it. And then basically after 45 minutes, I get this. I get my passport. Shit, you could freeze that. <gasps> anyway, so um, I get my passport and um, I can get on the plane and I can fly. And it took one hour. I felt so proud to be American <laughs> at that point 
British American. But um, it was just amazing. After that first experience where my heart just sank and I was like, oh God, I'm in the, I'm in the red tape. I'm in with these people who just don't give a shit about you. They're just like, they're just doing their job. And then every person after that at the American embassy was just kind and attentive and listening and present and there to help me. And it was an extraordinary feeling. I, I, it just, I just felt so lucky to be in there, you know. I got my passport out, got in there in plenty of time, got to the airport and flew back. Um, it was wonderful. It was truly a wonderful experience. So I highly recommend them. I'm going to put a Yelp review in for, uh, for the American Embassy in London on Nine Elms Lane. And I, this is where I do actually wish that more people watch these videos so that someone there watched this video to know uh, how gra grateful I am, how much gratitude I have for the way they did their job. Because they went above and beyond the call of duty and did a great job. Anyway, there you go. Um, that's it, and I got back into the country. I'm going to make more videos later about the actual trip to London and the premiere, which was fantastic. Um, and there were real reindeer there. <laughs> it was awesome. London was amazing, by the way. Oh, my God. I haven't been for 10 years, and 10 years ago when I went, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't like this very much. It was really busy and crowded and expensive, and everyone was rude. It was just horrible. This time, completely the opposite. We had an amazing time city is buzzing. They've got an election in a month. Maybe that's why, or a little less than a month. But the city just felt alive and exciting. The food was great. It was just, yeah, it was an awesome five-day trip. Truly wonderful. All right, you little nuggets. I'll do more videos later. Bye.